Please turn to Colossians chapter 4. We have said hello, and now we will say goodbye to an old friend, Colossians. It's been a good book, has fed us well. We will be moving on to the Psalms in the summer. So I hope you will be ready to read along with us and study through the Psalms with us this summer. Last week, I introduced this wonderful prayer out of Colossians 4, verses 2 through 6. We got through half of it last week, and today, Lord willing, we'll get through the other half of it. Um, I encourage you to memorize this prayer and pray it. I don't think Chris and Shannon will mind this, but uh, just yesterday, this is how hot off the press this is. Just yesterday, the Randolph family, they're going through a, a situation, needed prayer, and they were asking for wisdom and boldness and prayer. And I said, that's exactly what Colossians 4, 2 through 6 is about. So all that were included in that little group thread, I said, let's just start praying Colossians 4, 2 through 6 for Chris and Shannon in this situation. And lo and behold, um, they updated us. Late last night, early this morning, depending on how you look at 12.30 a.m., and um, which I was awake, by the way, but I didn't want to continue to respond because I didn't know who else was. And, and God answered this very prayer that Paul uh, wrote to the church in Colossae and now for our edification and good. So I encourage you to take hold of this prayer and pray it often for yourself and for your fellow uh, Christians, because God is pleased when we pray his word back to him, right? You, you don't have to wonder if you're praying according to the will of God when you pray the very scriptures and the very prayers that God inspired, when you pray those back to God for yourself and for the church. Um, so that was an encouragement. Well, with that said, would you please stand and we'll read through that prayer although we're really honing in on verses 5 and 6. Verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I also have been imprisoned that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, I will close at the end of this message just by showing you a few of the teammates that Paul called out. There's a dozen people from verse 7 to the end of this letter, verse 18, and he's really saying, in order for God's kingdom to grow and expand, in order for the church to flourish, it's going to take all of us. It's not just a one-man show, Paul the superhero. He's saying, I need all of you. And he lists 12 of them, some men, some women. But we'll close by reminding each of us here at Providence Baptist Church that it takes all of us um, there is no spiritual gift called bench warming, okay? Uh, we all need to be on the field, on the court, playing hard for King Jesus, all right? Now, last week, here's the tie-in. Last week, we spent a lot of time talking about prayer. You just, we just read that, verses 2, 3, and 4. Um, we said, before you talk to people about God, you need to talk to God about people. All right, so that's the tie-in from last week. And, and don't overlook that. 
And if you weren't here last week or you didn't hear that message, go back because verses 2, 3, and 4 are foundational for verses 5 and 6. Okay? Now, let me say it again. Before you talk to people about God, talk to God about people, but then talk to people. Okay? That, that's where we miss it sometimes. There's a lot of people who, oh, I, prayer, that's my gift. I, awesome. But he does want you to talk to people about God. And that's we, we see that in verses 5 and 6. But first, let's spend that time talking to God about them. Now, to walk in wisdom toward outsiders, verse 5. We talked a little bit about this last week. Let me just give you the quote that I gave you last week. To talk, or excuse me, to walk with wisdom toward outsiders means that we are to live in line with God's word so that those who are not Christians will see the beauty of Christ in our lives and our relationships. And that gives us the platform to tell them the good news that changed our lives. Amen? Live in such a way that doesn't hinder the gospel that you are now speaking to an unbeliever. Let me say that one more time. Live in such a way that does not hinder the gospel that you are now speaking to an unbeliever. Y'all may remember this story. Um, years ago when Amy and I lived in Memphis, we had some neighbors, uh, Joe and Paula. And they were unbelievers. In fact, Joe was very anti-God. He had been raised in a strict Jehovah's Witness home, and he learned to hate religion and hate God. And so when we talked to them a few times, they made it clear, no thank you. Well, we, we had one of our children, I think it was Anna Grace, I think it was Anna Grace. And we had a baby monitor. You know, if you've had kids, you know about these. And um, so we, we're doing our thing, you know, raising kids, um, trying to love Jesus. I was pastoring a church there. And we're, we do prayer walks all the time in our neighborhood. And when we would see Joe and Paula, we would wave at them. You know, we tried to be as nice and cordial as we could. Well, one particular day, we're doing that, and I'd wave at Joe, and he beckons me over and I thought okay I've been praying for an opportunity here here goes and he said sort of sheepishly he said hey uh, you know we just had a baby as well and um, Nikki was her name and uh, we got a baby monitor and somehow some way our baby monitor is on the same frequency that yours and Amy's is and we've been listening in on your house for the past week Right? And that's not, cre that's not creepy at all. <laughs> right? Not creepy at all. Just, um, and I, here's, here was my thought. Lord, have we represented Jesus well? Lord, this unbeliever has heard, you know? And, and I did, I thought about that for just a second. And then I, and then I, I you know, not, I'm not saying this about me, but I said, yeah, we have. We, we've represented Jesus well. I know we have. Because... Amy and I have always, in life and in parenting, just tried to be real with people. And when we mess up, and we do mess up, we are quick to repent. We're, qu we're quick to ask for forgiveness or offer forgiveness. We're, we're quick to nip it in the bud and, and go back to Jesus quickly. And so I, I felt like, yeah, I don't know what he's heard. I don't know if he's heard any fussing or fighting or disciplining our children in anger. But if he did, I'm sure he heard quickly repentance and, and oh, that didn't honor Jesus. Would you forgive me? And, and so all that was flashing through my mind. And, and I said to him, oh, my, I hope we haven't, you know, said anything or done anything that would make you not believe that Jesus is real. And he said, oh, no, no, quite the contrary. He said, at first we, we wanted to turn it off and think, oh, that's violating their privacy. But then he said, I, I'd be honest with you, there was a part of me that wanted to see if you guys were real, to see if this was just what you do on Sunday morning. And he said, I'm, I must say, I'm still not a believer, but 
it's not because of you. I, can, I know you believe. I know your wife believes. You guys are the real deal. So, I, again, I don't say that at all to puff myself up or to puff Amy up. But that's what, what Paul is saying here. Live, conduct yourself in front of unbelievers with wisdom, making the most of the opportunity, literally, the opportunity, meaning like God's providing an opportunity here for you. Are you going to walk through that door? Okay. So be specific in your prayers, verses two, three, and four. Be relentless in your prayers, verses two, three, and four. Live a godly life in front of unbelievers and then walk through the door that God is opening. Because he will open a door, I promise you that. God wants to save people much more than you want to see them saved. And I hope you want to see them saved. But God wants that even more than you want that. And so he will provide a door for you to walk through. Literally, that word, um, make the most of the opportunity. It's a word used for someone who spotted a good deal and snatched it up before somebody else got it. When I went to um, seminary in Memphis, Bellevue Baptist Church, Adrian Rogers, pastor there, they had this thing once a year, the beginning of the school year for the seminarians called the Bellevue Shopping Spree. You remember that, Amy? And this church had about 30,000 members, so they could pull something like this off, but they had a huge gymnasium and their members donated stuff for the, for the seminary students. I mean, cars, okay? There were cars that they had uh, around the, the corner in, from that gymnasium. Washers and dryers, Todd and Ariana, all right? They had clothes. They had you know, dishwashers. They had toys for your kids. They had, they had it all. I mean, this was putting on the Ritz, and, and they would let the seminary students have at it for about three hours until it was gone. Now that really tested your faith in Christ, right? Tested your love for your fellow brother because, you know, I put my hand on that car just before you did. I know I did. There's the camera. We can go to the replay if we need to, but it was a, but the point is that's the Greek word here. It means you see a good deal and you snatch it up without hesitation. Is that, is that you? So far, are, are you seeing? I remember I told you these two things would make us look at our feet, shuffle our feet, and feel guilty. And Paul doesn't mean to do that. But asking somebody, how's your prayer life? Oh, uh, I, I could always do better. Of course you could. So could I. How are you talking to unbelievers about Jesus? Oh, I could do better. Of course you could. So could I. But again, Paul's not telling us this to beat us up. He, he wants to strengthen us. All right? So you're sitting in a chair. It's got four legs. I want you to think about this. Here's the four legs that we see. Uh, praying. Living a godly life. Speaking the gospel clearly. And, and snatching those opportunities up when they come. Those are the four legs of the chair that you're sitting in, and that chair's pretty stable, right? But that, when those four things line up, there is power. And so I hope that as we're continuing to plow through this, you're taking notes of where you need to grow, and you're taking notes of where God has grown you, and you're giving him the credit and the glory. Let's look at verse 6. Let your speech... Here's, here's where we're talking, right? So up to this point, we've been praying a lot and living a certain lifestyle. But now here we come. Here's the speaking. And that's what you do when you, when you walk through the door that God provided for you to, to be a witness. You're going to speak. And what are you going to say? Well, verse 6, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond 
to each person. What does that mean? Let your speech always be with grace. Well, at least these two things. We are hardwired from birth to try to earn salvation. It doesn't matter if you go to Nigeria or if you go to Australia, if you go to the Bahamas, if you go to Florida, if you go to Rome, Georgia. Every man, woman, boy, girl, child, red, brown, yellow, black, white, young, old, male, female, educated, non-educated, we are hardwired to try to earn our salvation from God. And so part of this, let your speech always be with grace, means that we who have tasted of the grace of God in Christ, we who know that it is not by works, it is by faith in Christ alone, we must be just it must be dripping off of our tongues everywhere we go, every time we speak to someone, that salvation is not by our works. It is by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. I promise you people need to hear that. Do not take for granted that they understand that. And then secondly, being gracious means that you're humble. You're not arrogant. You're not uh, living a superior life to the person, the unbeliever with whom you're having a spiritual conversation. Who was it that said uh, the definition of evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread? And so that's, that's part of this graciousness. If you know me well at all, you know that my least favorite T-shirt, my least favorite bumper sticker is the coexist bumper sticker. But my least favorite T-shirt is the one that says, y'all need Jesus. I do not like that shirt. And I hope you don't like that shirt. And if you have that shirt, I hope you will take a permanent marker and scratch through the word y'all and put the word I. I need Jesus. It's true that they need Jesus, absolutely, but that just doesn't open the doors of conversation usually very humbly and graciously, does it? With your finger pointed right between their eyes, y'all need Jesus. But when you can say, oh, I need Jesus, I need him, that tends to open doors and build bridges. And of course they need him, just like you do. But that is much more of a winsome witness. And then he says this uh, prepositional phrase, a modifier, telling us how to let our speech be with grace. As though seasoned with salt. Salt makes food tastier. Salt makes food have a zest and a zing to it. You know this. What Paul is saying is, you were once dead and now you're alive. You were once an enemy of the king of kings, but now you're a friend, a son, a daughter, seated at, seated at his table having a banquet feast with him. Be humble, yes, but be lively. You're speaking words of life to people, gracious words of life. Don't be dull. Don't be cold. Don't be dry. Don't be boring. This isn't a personality thing, lest you say, well, that's, you got that personality covered, Brent. I don't have that. No, this isn't a personality thing. This is an amazing grace thing. This is a, I'm a new creation in Christ thing. Now let me ask you, is Jesus bland and boring? Are his teachings bland and boring? Is the whole counsel of God from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, is that a dry and dull book? Of course not. 
Is God's word dull or boring when he warns us about hell? The fire is never quenched and the worm never dies. Is that a boring, yawning description? Or in God's many invitations to us to be saved, is that bland, dry, dull, cold? When he implores us to be satisfied in Christ as we eat the bread of life and drink the living water. No, it's not. And so this commandment, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. This is God's giving you permission. He's giving you more than permission. He's giving you a commandment to be lively, to be interesting, to impart words of life-giving grace to people when you speak. Think about your testimony. And we've already covered this. If you're visiting with us, I'll just give you a quick heads up. There's no boring testimony, right? Sometimes you'll hear somebody, oh, I just got one of those boring testimonies. I was seven years old, raised in a Christian family, and God saved me, and I've never looked back. I don't have the testimony like him where he was hooked up to sex, drugs, and rock and roll and got saved when he was 99 years old. There's no boring testimony. You know this. Because you're telling the wonderful story of God's glory. Amen? You're telling about your glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. I encourage you to immerse yourself in the whole counsel of God. Find and use powerful biblical illustrations when you share the gospel. Take what God gives you in the moment and turn the conversation to Christ and watch God show up and show out. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a dozen or two. A uh, little segue conversation starters, right? And have a handful of these on hand. But, but again, don't just follow Brent. This is just saying walk with Jesus. Be so amazed at the grace of God in Christ in your life. Be steeped in the word of God and be watching for opportunities, ready to walk through the door and pounce on that deal when you see it. People say, and I call this fishing. You know, if you do, if you ever fish, there's a reason it's called fishing and not catching, right? Because <laughs> you don't always catch, but you can fish. So I call this fishing. And, and sometimes I get a bite on the hook, and sometimes I don't. People say, how are you? I'm much better than I deserve. You know that one, right? I think we have, um, who's the, the financial guy? Um, Dave Ramsey, I think he kind of came up with that one. We've all heard that one. I'm much better than I deserve. You know, what am I saying there? Is it true? It's true. But also, I'm hoping that somebody's going to say, what? That's an interesting way of looking at life. What do you mean by that? Oh, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, right? That was lucky. Oh, luck had nothing to do with it. I'm a blessed man. All right. Here, here's one of my favorites. Uh, did you notice God's power in the storm last night? Or, talking about a sunrise or a sunset, boy, God really painted a masterpiece for us, didn't he? Amy and I, we just got back from vacation celebrating our 25th, and we, we took a little cruise, um, dolphin sightseeing cruise for the sunset, and there was a gentleman and his wife sitting beside me, and I said because we hadn't seen many sunsets all week because it was cloudy. And I said, man, I'm really praying that God shows up and shows out and paints a masterpiece for us tonight. And Glenn from Houston, Texas said, I like, I like the way you're thinking. Honey, come here. Listen to what he just said. Two hours later, right, we're just talking about Jesus the whole cruise. I probably talked about Jesus too much and neglected my beautiful bride there. But for the grace of God, that could be me. 
right? You're, you're with other people, some of whom are unbelievers, and something happens, and everybody's just throwing judgment on that person. Ah, how dare he? What a loser. Oh, but for the grace of God, that could be me. That's a conversation starter, right? Maybe. Have you prayed about that? We had an opportunity, and I, I, I'll tell you, I, I struck out on this one. We, we went to Shipwreck Island and did a little, little uh, riding the, the inner tubes like we did when we were kids because we didn't have our kids with us. And uh, there was a young lady there who just sort of tagged along with us and said, hey, I got left behind. Y'all mind if I tag along with y'all? Her name was Delenn from Missouri, and she was just telling us her story of, how she chose Missouri, Mizzou in Columbia, Missouri, and, and what's her future. And, and, and nothing was about prayer or about seeking God. It was just, you know, I just I decided I'd do this and thought I'd do this. And it was burning on my heart to ask her uh, to share Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 with her. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path but I didn't, I didn't. And then she left and went her way and we went our way. And I prayed even this morning for Delenn from Mizzou in Columbia, Missouri. But I was thinking that and I wanted to walk through that door, but I let the door shut before I did. Sit down at a restaurant. Hey, uh, Susan, we're about to pray for our meal. How could we pray for you today? You know, sometimes people are going to look at you like you're crazy and say, uh, no thanks. But sometimes they're going to pull up a chair and say, you don't know how much I needed to hear that. Last year, Sydney was in um, Minnesota. She was a waitress, and she has grown up seeing me do that. And sometimes a little, you know, dad. Um, but she was a waitress. And she said she felt so alone there because there were no other Christians. And one particular table, she walked up to them and said, Hello, my name is Sydney. How can I serve you tonight? And they said, Well, hello, Sydney. How can we pray for you? And she said, For the first time, I was on this side of the table, not this side. And she said, It it changed my day. It changed my week. It changed my summer. I, I sat down and poured my heart out to them and told them how they could pray for me. You hear somebody say something at work or, or you know, at the ball game, and it's just, it's just wrong. Let's say it like it is. You might say, hey, you know what? We're learning about that at church. We're learning what the Bible says about that at church. Do you have a church home? Would you like to come and have a cup of coffee with me and then sit by me at church? Again, guys, I'm just giving you some, some ways to let your, your speech be with grace, to let it be seasoned with salt. Got two more. These are, these are fresh. Told you we went to uh, Shipwreck Island. We're sitting there, and... Uh, deciding whether we're going to get a snack or something to eat. It cost me a kidney to get in. It was going to cost me a lung to eat a snack. So I was just sitting there thinking, can I make it till we get back to the hotel to eat? And this guy walks up with a box about this big, and he says, hey, my buddies and I are over there, and we ordered way too much pizza. I cannot eat all this pizza. Would you and your wife like this pizza? And Amy, and probably you might have been like this too, said, um, thank you, but no thank you. I raised the lid, looked at it, said, you betcha, right? <laughs> said, bring it on. So I'm sitting there, and it's huge, four slices of pizza, each slice as big as my head. And I'm eating. And I eat one. Amy, you want one? No, you know, red sauce hurts my stomach. So I'm not going to be able to eat this whole thing. So I eat another one. Now I got two huge pieces left. Now, there those guys are sitting right over there that gave me the pizza. I'm praying. I'm doing that Colossians 4, 2, 3, and 4 already. Well, I'm full. I can't eat anymore. So here comes a 20-year-old walking by me. I said, hey, 
Want a piece of pizza? It's free. Yeah, man, I'll take one. So he grabs one. I said, eat the other one. I can't, you know. No, I'm good. Just one. Here comes a little eight-year-old girl with her mama. Mama, pizza. I said, you want this? You know, and I know it's with kids. It's a little weird. I look up at mama, and I'm like, hey, it's free. You, you, she wants it. She can have it. Yeah, thank you. So she gets it. So then I go over to those guys. They're watching me give the pizza away that they gave to me. And I don't know what they were thinking about that, honestly, but I was praying. I walked over and I said, guys, I can't help but turn this moment toward a spiritual reality. Can I have a minute of your time? Yeah, what's, what's going on? I said, you know, when somebody gives you something and it's good, and that was some good pizza, and it's free, you just want to give it away. So I ate two slices, and I gave two slices away. And they said, oh, we know, we know, we saw you do that. And I said, but that's, that's how it is with Jesus Christ. He is better than that pizza, and he was absolutely free, cost me nothing, and I just can't help but give him away to as many people as I can. Now, you could do something like that. You may say, that's not my personality. Again, this is not a personality thing. This is a, I have tasted that the Lord is good and I can't keep him to myself thing. Listen to what um, L.R. Scarborough says about sharing your faith. He says, it brings joy to four worlds. The world of the sinner's heart that repents and believes in Jesus. The world of his loved ones who have been praying for him. The hearts of the person leading him to Christ. And even heaven itself is filled with joy when one sinner repents. He says, this joy in seeing others come to know Christ is the fullest and richest joy known to the experience of man. None is like the joy of the soul winner. L.R. Scarborough. Lottie Moon said it this way, surely there can be no greater joy on earth than leading another person to Jesus Christ. Brent Wells says it this way, I am on planet earth to glorify God and to enjoy him forever and to multiply that joy by leading others to do the same. I know that this can be intimidating. I know that this can be shaming when we talk about this. Again, people look at their feet. Oh, I don't have that gift. Oh, you have that gift. I could never do that. I'm telling you, and, and Paul's going to tell us because he's going to give us 12 names in just a minute of other men and women who were absolutely essential for the kingdom of God to expand and the church to flourish as God intended. This is not a one-man show thing. This is every hand on deck thing. And when you step out in faith, and you will stumble and bumble and fumble. You will. So will I. I told you that precious young lady, Delenn from Columbia, uh, Missouri, I struck out with her. Just struck out. I, I, I'll never see her again. I'm praying for her, but I will never see her again. I had an opportunity. The door was cracked. I didn't walk through it. But when you start to live this way, it is contagious. It is contagious with one another and it's just contagious even from within, if that makes sense. You are looking and hoping and praying for another opportunity. Let me give you one more. Last night, some of you know I have a little part-time uh, job on Saturday night at the rooftop in downtown Rome. I'm a security guard. Just think of Barney Fife, right? Some of you don't even know who that is. Well, I pull up, and there's these two guys, and I don't know. They kind of looked a little suspicious to me, and I said, hey, guys, how you doing? Uh, you got to wrap it up. This is a parking deck. So they're taking pictures of their, of their hot rides, right? And the guy came over to me, and he said, um, 
hey, listen, if you don't mind, can we have five minutes to just take a few pictures? He said, I've got five, uh, he said, I've got 55,000 followers on Instagram and I'm trying to reach 100,000. And if you'll let me do this, I can beef up my likes and my followers. I said, I'll give you five minutes. So I went to the rooftop, checked it out, prayed. Chris, I was praying this Colossians 4, 2 through 6 prayer because I knew I was going to go back down there and have one final word with them before they left. I said, Lord, how am I going to talk to them about Jesus? Um, can you give me some kind of a segue, you know, so that they'll, these young 20-year-olds will listen to me? And this thought hit me, and I know it was from the Lord. And I said, that, that'll work right there. So I drove down. And there they are, and they're rolling their eyes like, oh, has it been five minutes already? We're still taking pictures, you know. And so they start to get into their car, and I, I gave them the old wrap it up, but come here uh, signal. They came over to me. They, they thought they were in trouble, you know. They're, I said, guys, listen, I gave you five minutes. Will you give me five minutes of Jesus? Uh, sure, sure. I said, I was praying for you up on the rooftop, and this thought hit me. You're into this, these algorithms of, I got to have more followers, I got to have more likes. I said, when you stand before the Lord one day and He has reviewed your life, will He give it a like or an unlike? And they said, I, I like that. That's a, that's a great question. And we talked for about an hour, right? I kept looking at my watch like, hey, I, I just said five minutes, so y'all are free to go. And they said, we, we don't want to go. And I, I believe that Alex and Will are Christians. I really do. They shared their testimony with me. Um, they told, because they said, I believe God would hit the like button on my life. I said, well, what does God like? Because if he likes your life, you must think that you're living in such a way that he approves. What, what kinds of things does God like? What kinds of things does God not like? And we had a wonderfully biblical conversation together. And these two guys were sharp. And I believe that they're following Jesus Christ. When, when it was all said and done, I said, look, guys, I got more, more knuckleheads to run off the the parking deck, you know, let me go. And they said, please don't leave without praying for us. I prayed for Alex. I prayed for Will. I gave them the cross, John. I reminded them that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Guys, I, I, I hope and pray that you're not hearing or thinking that Brent talked for 30 minutes puffing himself up. I'm telling you, ways that God has grown me and stretched me and he will do the same for you so that verses five and six become a reality in your life. Let's just read them again. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity, the opportunity, meaning God's going to provide it. He will. You just got to see it and have the courage to walk through it. And God's with you the whole step of the way. Verse six, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. That last little phrase seems to be out of nowhere. So that you will know how to respond. Knowing how to respond to outsiders will come from being rooted and grounded in God's grace being rooted and grounded in prayer, and seeking to clearly speak the gospel. I, I, I promise you that. That, that's, that is a cause and effect type verse, and God is saying, when you are praying, when you are living a righteous life, repenting when you don't, when you are speaking the gospel clearly and taking the opportunities that God gives you, you will know how to respond to each person's need. God's just going to give you that. 
John Piper says it this way, wise and winsome words come from hearts that are relishing grace and savoring the salt of God's utterly unboring son, Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Wise and winsome words come from hearts that are relishing grace and savoring the salt of God's utterly unboring son, Jesus Christ. And then, as I said, verses 7 through 18, he gives us 12 names. And I don't have time to go through those 12 names. But I want you to look at those names. Some of them you're going to recognize. Some of them you're not going to recognize. Uh, Tychicus, in verse 7. Uh, he was a Gentile. God saved him. And he was a trustworthy person because Paul would send letters back and forth through Tychicus to Ephesians, to Colossians, and probably Philemon. Onesimus, you, you're going to hear about him next week, so I won't steal Hunter's thunder. But we know of him from the book of Philemon. I'll just give you that. Mark chapter 4, verse 10 and that's interesting because if you remember our study through the book of Acts, Mark deserted Paul when Paul needed him most, so much so that the next time Paul was rounding up other helpers for his missionary journey, he said, I don't want Mark. But here, about 12 years after that incident, Paul is saying to the Colossians, you need to welcome this brother. You need to welcome him. He's a faithful fellow brother in the faith. Epaphras, we've already talked about him in chapter 1. Now we see him again in chapter 4, verse 12. Uh, he is the one who made his way to the prison in Rome. Paul led him to Christ, and then he came back and started a church in, Colossian, in Colossae. Luke. Now, this is the only passage in the Bible that tells us that Luke was a doctor. It says Luke, the beloved physician. It's only here that we learn that Luke was a doctor. Uh, he was a Gentile, and he accompanied Paul on some of his missionary journeys, including the shipwreck on the way to Rome. We read about that in Acts 28. So, uh, toward the end of Paul's ministry, in 2 Timothy 4.11, he says, Only Luke stood with me in my second imprisonment. And then we have this, this person, Demas. Do you see that? Uh, and there's nothing really said about him. It's just, and Demas. There's a reason Paul doesn't say any more than that. Because just as with Mark, we see somebody who left the team but came back, with Demas, he left the team and didn't come back. And we see that in, chapter, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. And I think that's important. I think, I think that's intentional. Paul is saying, you cannot do this alone. You need other brothers and sisters in Christ. Some of them are going to disappoint you but they're going to come back, so don't give up on them. And some of them are going to disappoint you and not come back. But keep your eyes on Jesus. The common denominator, if you go through verses 7 through 18, the common denominator of descriptive words and phrases to describe these 12, save Demas, our beloved brother, our beloved sister, our faithful servants, our fellow bond servants in the Lord, Jews, Greeks, young, old. The common denominator there is that there, there's a fellowship. You're a Christian, I'm a Christian, we're on team Jesus, and we need each other. That's what Paul is really driving home here. Have you heard of the 80-20 rule? where 20% of the church does 80% of the work, right? 
That's not what you see in verses 7 through 18. Paul is saying, I'm imprisoned. I can't go and come like I please. So I'm, I'm praying for you, church. I'm even writing this letter, and I'm going to send it to you. But I need every one of you, all hands on deck, for the kingdom to grow, for the church to flourish. Mark Dever, in his commentary here, he says, we need to be leery of catering to people who are just like us. The danger of this approach is that it obscures the supernatural diversity that the gospel produces. Notice there's men here, there's women here. There's Jews here, there's Gentiles here. They're young here, they're old here, right? Some of them you've heard of, some of them you haven't heard of. And Endeavor's and saying they're all working together as the body of Christ. Endeavor says, it's not that all these groups are intrinsically wrong. Rather, there should be relationships where you're only friends with that person because you're a Christian and he is too, she is too, without any worldly explanation. He says, I encourage you to befriend people who come to your church, whom you do not naturally gravitate towards. Some of them like contemporary style of worship, some like traditional. Some are young, some are old, some are from this background, some from this background. He says, have them over for dinner. Share your stories of how you came to know Christ. On Sundays, deliberately look for people who are not like you and welcome them. In heaven, you will be with such people. Revelation 7, 9, men and women from every language, tribe, nation, and tongue. You may as well get to know them now, Dever says. <laughs> because for all of eternity, you will be worshiping with them. Does that make sense? Do you understand what he's saying in these final verses? These are not just throwaway verses. He is saying, in order for this to work, it's going to take all of us. And some are going to disappoint you. You know about that? I know about that. Some who disappoint you are going to repent and come back. You know about that? I know about that. Some who disappoint you are going to walk away and not come back. You know about that? No, you don't, do you? Because there's still time. It was a trick question. I don't know about that either. I know they haven't come back yet. But what's to say that God might not bring them back today? Amen? So it takes all of us. Let's do away with this 80-20 principle where 20% of the church does 80% of the work. And by the way, it's not even work. It's worship. And let's, let's all pick up an oar and row the boat. As I said there is no spiritual gift called being a bench warmer. God wants all of us, no matter your personality, no matter your background, no matter your testimony of whether you were saved at 7 or 70, he wants us all to pray hard, verses 2, 3, and 4, to walk the walk, to seize the opportunity, to let our lips be dripping with the grace of God in Jesus Christ, seasoned with salt, responding to each person as the Lord gives us insight to do so. When all that's happening, guys, and it's not just from one or two of us, but it's the church doing this, that's, that's a beautiful thing. That's power. That's a powerful witness that the world cannot ignore. 
Let's pray together. Last week we talked about praying today, about living, and about speaking. What has God impressed upon your heart? What does he want you to believe, to obey? With whom will you share these insights? Heavenly Father, we thank you for saving us. May we always live astonished and amazed at the grace of God. May we never point our finger at someone and say, y'all need Jesus. May we point our finger at ourselves and say, I need Jesus as much today as I did the day he saved me. Why don't you come and follow me because I'm following Jesus. Oh, Lord, we pray that we would remember the joy that you've shown us today, the joy of, of introducing people to Jesus. They're going to rejoice. Their loved ones are going to rejoice. We're going to rejoice, and even heaven itself is going to rejoice. God, maybe there's someone who has left the church. Right now we're thinking about them. Maybe we've written them off as, well, they'll never come back. But we see that Mark came back, and we don't know that you might not be about to bring Demas back as well. So we pray for them. What role would you have us play in this? If you're here today or watching or listening to this and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, a believer in Christ, you've not tasted that the Lord is good, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? It's a hard road, I will not lie. But it's a road that your brothers and sisters in Christ will walk with you. And much more importantly, it's a road that Jesus Christ will walk with you every step of the way. Father, we pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.